Welcome to Charity Village Connects. Today we are exploring the potential impacts of Bill S216 on the nonprofit sector and how the proposed bill could change the way charities are able to work with frontline community groups that don't have a charitable status. Joining me today is Bill Mintram, Director of Indigenous and Northern Relations at the Rideau Hall Foundation. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. Bill, I'd like to start with uh, understanding um, for our listeners what the Rideau Hall Foundation does, and in particular, perhaps an overview of your role as the Director of Indigenous and Northern Relations at the Foundation. For sure. The Rideau Hall Foundation has a variety of operations uh, that include uh, coming up in the very near future here, a Canadian Innovation Week uh, with the Governor General's Innovation Awards. We also uh, support uh, and help uh, operate the Queen Elizabeth Scholars Program and uh, a new initiative called Ingenious Plus uh, with uh, high school students uh, around innovation. Uh, we also uh, are the managing partners for the Arctic Inspiration Prize, uh, awarding uh, over $3 million per year in uh, Canada's north. And uh, we are, we've just launched over this last year a funding stream called Catapult, uh, providing supports for access to education. And we're in a development phase and, and beginning to roll out uh, supports in the space of Indigenous teacher education. Uh, those are a few areas. Uh, we're also just uh, ramping up. Uh, we, we've taken over uh, Forum for Young Canadians uh, and we'll be um, supporting the ability to uh, continue that uh, that initiative's long 40 plus year history uh, in being able to engage young people um, in in Ottawa and uh, and or virtually and uh, around uh, citizenship, around um, governance and uh yeah, being able to meet leaders uh, across our nation. And maybe you could just sort of uh, give us a little bit of an overview of the kind of work that you do as the as the Director of Indigenous and Northern Relations at the Foundation. For sure. I have the honor and, and privilege of being able to support all the portfolios of the Foundation to really help uh, the organization on uh, that reconciliation-based journey. And uh, that can mean many things, and, and uh, I'm looking forward to speaking more about that uh, over this time. But I also get the, the chance to help develop uh, initiatives and, and programs that will have a, an impact in, in communities and uh, allowing uh, for myself to be able to really give back to community in a meaningful way, uh, but being able to do so uh, through relationship building, through um, collaboration, partnership, and uh, in particular, uh, an initiative that I am um, heavily responsible for at, at this moment is um, establishing uh, supports mm -hmm. and allyship-based uh, um, an allyship-based journey with the Indigenous teacher education sector, and being able to provide uh, the potential of funding uh, and uh, and material supports. However, doing so in, in a very different way than the norm, because uh, it, it requires really listening, learning, helping uh, to help us understand how can we connect and journey and walk with uh, organizations and communities in their vision uh, for what their the potential in their communities. And we know that Indigenous education is a huge part of meeting um, our, the National um, Center for Truth and Reconciliation, which has taken over that mandate for the, 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 the TRC, uh, and being able to really uh, help Canada in, in journeying towards having more educators, Indigenous educators, uh, but being able to link that into the uh, opportunity that has for being transformational in terms of language and culture within Indigenous communities, but also for all Canadians, that education is a key to uh, being able to really walk out reconciliation as a nation. And so this, uh, this initiative is uh, attempting to be able to embark on a journey uh, and doing so as a collaboration, as a partnership, as an ally, and uh, striving to to really do that in a good way. Um, 
I, I'm, I'm really excited about being able to talk a bit more about that later in our discussion. I just wanted to bring the conversation back to your perspective on Bill S216. And um, from your role within the foundation, what benefits do you see it bringing to the Indigenous communities and Indigenous-led organizations? Well, I can tell you as an example, uh, providing funding as a as a non for a non indigenous organization uh, to a non qualified donee uh, who is who are indigenous recipients uh, that I have been working on funding agreements uh, just over the last number of months uh, within that space, and uh, the the current uh, way that we have to go about providing that funding uh, is. Uh, in my perspective, it's I feel a bit awkward. I feel like I'm being disrespectful because I have to create um, agreements that essentially outline that uh, I am going to provide funds from a non-Indigenous organization to an Indigenous organization, and I'm going to tell them that their use of these funds are only under uh, their operating and doing everything that uh, for their community impact uh, on behalf of my organization and and my charitable objects, not their mission and mandate, not their ability to be self-determining and to be able to impact their communities in a meaningful way. I have to communicate to them in an agreement that they're they're working on behalf of a non-indigenous entity, and everything they do is uh, for the purposes of that non-indigenous entity. And that, uh, frankly, it, it it is not showing respect. And I know in talking with them, I will communicate that in a very different way and express that this agreement is unfortunately the means by which we must uh, conduct uh, these uh, transfer of funds towards uh, still. The public good still towards charitable activities, but they may not be through a recognized charity, uh, but rather a nonprofit uh, that's still providing valuable work within their communities. Well, I think what you're talking about so eloquently is is what Senator Omidvar has referred to in conversations with me about the current law in creating almost a if not a neocolonialist kind of approach, then a continuation of that kind of um, uh, paternal, uh, uh, inappropriate relationship uh, in connection to the Indigenous people in Canada that isn't appropriate to where we are in our reconciliation journey today. Is am I am I expressing this correctly? Very correctly. That uh, if I were to take. Uh, uh, project agreement for providing funding to a non-qualified donee who is an Indigenous recipient, and I were to try and uh, try and tell them that we want to work with you in a reconciliatory manner, we want to work with you in a relationship-driven manner, we believe in you, we trust in you, but yet the words I'm putting in paper and asking them to sign off on don't demonstrate that trust. They don't demonstrate that ability for autonomy, that ability for self-determination. And that uh, is the opposite of the direction that we should be heading as a nation. And so uh, Bill S-216 does address some of those areas to be able to still maintain those accountability measures, but being able to enter into a much more respectful relationship with those who are doing amazing work for the public good. I've talked to legal specialists that have also referred to the current law as creating almost, in particular, almost a legal fiction in the sense of using that sort of language that's required under the present law, because, of course, a lot of the funders, the charitable organizations may not have direct direct control over the actions in the community groups and, in fact, shouldn't be having that uh, kind of direct control uh, as it as it is defined under the income tax act pre- presently do you agree with that now can you define mm-hmm. what you mean by direct control uh, direction and control rather uh, the, the, that kind of language that's required um that in that sense 
that that isn't the relationship that is being sought after, but it is the one that has to go into the paperwork under the present law. And their concern is that it also um, is not only uh, disrespectful in terms of what is trying to be achieved here, but also uh, and and expensive, but also creates something of a legal fiction. I would say that it it, it, it as a funder, it would be quite uncomfortable to go into a community. And if you are maintaining that concept of direction and control, uh, if you decided that you disagreed with the way that they're doing something, but at the same time, it was community led, community driven, uh, they're meeting community identified outcomes that I would have no place to go in and question the work that they're doing if it's achieving that. And me being able to, in theory, have control to go in and say, sorry, I disagree. I, I don't believe you're doing the appropriate work because it doesn't meet the standards that I think it should be or the, the work that I believe should be done, uh, which is also one of the major challenges that um, we're looking for transformation within the philanthropic sector. Because if we're going to support Indigenous peoples, Indigenous organizations, Indigenous communities, we need to be able to um, understand what is uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples telling us? What is the TRC telling us? What is uh, many of these really critical uh, elements that help to define an opportunity to work in relationship with Indigenous peoples, to understand that they should have people at the decision-making table, and to be able to allow them to determine their own social structures, health structures, uh, and, and various other uh, structures. And if they're defining it, that means it's their, their policies, their systems, their structures, not um, not provincial structures and, and legislation, not um, other systems and structures that may exist outside of those communities. And if we are going to truly allow um, for those to be carried out, uh, for the for uh, UNDRIP, United Nations Declaration of Rights and Indigenous Peoples, and TRC calls to action, if we're going to carry those out, um, it's important that we're not also actively walking out things that are in direct contradiction to them. And uh, direction and control is important within that framework of accountability. But in terms of being able to come in as the power holder to define how a community should function or what coming in with a potential solution, uh, that has been um, a major issue for a long time because when you come in as a charitable organization and say, we've got this amazing solution or this mm -hmm. amazing program, it's going to change everything you do and, and fix whatever the perceived challenge is. But then they come in, they do something, they leave, um, and the community goes, but they may, they may not have uh, feel they've received what they were promised in the beginning, that the proposed solution didn't have the legacy and the impact and the community transformational change that the community is looking for. And so instead of uh, coming in with the expectation of uh, we know best, it's really being able to align with communities' understanding, communities' vision, uh, communities' uh, the, the potential for community-driven outcomes, that when we can align that aspect of direction and control, with being able to meet those elements, that's, I think, where we, we will start to see a lot more change. And, but it's, a, it's, a, it's not simple to, to try and map that out or define what that means. So in a practical sense, I guess from your role as a funder, can you talk about or explain to a listener who may not be as familiar with the bill, how Bill S216 can benefit your work as it relates to your role as a, as a funder? Well, I would say as I develop uh, contribution agreements and for a non-qualified donee, it's not a contribution agreement because we're not able, at the present time, we're not able to tell them, hey, we believe in the work that you're doing. We know that the work is 
going to you're going to be accountable. You're going to meet the outcomes that that have been stated. And uh, at the moment, I have to enter into a relationship with them where the paperwork tells them that they have no control uh, over the work that they're going to carry out and that it's not for the purposes of their own uh, organization's mission and mandate. And the this transition in the language and the way of working uh, with uh, what is being proposed by Bill S-216 allows for me to not only talk with them about what how we're able to come alongside them and provide supports, but also allow me to uh, have the paperwork directly reflect that, where it shows that we believe in them, we trust in them. Uh, we're still asking for uh, accountability measures, but we're able to define that in a more appropriate way than saying, uh, this isn't your work, this isn't being done by you, it's being done by me. Instead, we believe in you, we trust in you, and uh, we will ask for a variety of measures that will help to represent the, the work that you've done uh, and the success achieved. And so on my end, that makes that relationship building with Indigenous uh, organizations and communities that much more effective because then I'm able to really walk the talk uh, through the paperwork, through all of the different elements that uh, that I have to go through in being able to provide uh, financial supports. And uh, to um, to people who may have uh, questions about the efficacy of the, um, I guess the, uh, the 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 accountability and um, the that are proposed in the bill. Um, could you just give me your perspective on what is in the the proposed bill uh, related to that sort of uh, accountability and trans um, transparency that um, that and, and whether you think that they're sufficient for um, for this kind of uh, relationship? Well, unfortunately, I can't speak uh, to the the fine print detail as it relates to the accountability measures. Uh, it, it is, uh, I can speak without going back into the document and really pulling it out uh, in a precise format, uh, but rather I do know that from uh, when I have read through it and when I have uh, spoken with others about it, that uh, there is the acknowledgement and the intentionality where uh, there is still a, a very strict um, accountability requirements that are being uh, carried forward so that the CRA requirements aren't being, it's not a complete revolutionary change where uh, those uh, funds can go to any source or without um, proper oversight, without proper accountability, without uh, those types of mechanisms in place, that it does maintain those uh, accountability structures but allows for them to be carried out in a way that's much more in line with how we as uh, how we can walk in relationship in a good way with nonprofit, non-qualified donees, uh, and of which uh, many Indigenous organizations and many entities in the North uh, in particular, that there are very few charities in Canada's North, uh, but there are many nonprofits doing amazing work and uh, giving back to their community through charitable like operations. And uh, there are also Indigenous organizations that uh, because of their their journey and self-determination um, have not felt, uh, have felt that it, it may be contrary to their mission and mandate to um, come under um, ad additional federal regulation uh, because it takes away from their ability to be self-determining. And so there are numerous uh, different reasons why the organizations are uh, the way they are, uh, but this does give an opportunity for additional, uh, for philanthropic resources uh, to still be used for philanthropic purposes, uh, but be able to have a more respectful approach, have a broader reach uh, to where there are uh, amazing work being done, impacting communities in profound ways, and this opens up that opportunity uh, to do that it, it, with greater respect, 
but still maintaining that accountability. Uh, I'm curious um, about your ideas related to uh, you know, recent history, if, for example, in an article from 2021, data suggested that the Indigenous-led organizations received only 0.05%, half a percent of funds given out by charities in 2018. Can you speak to this reality? And in your mind, is Bill S-216 likely to make a big difference? Well, I wouldn't say that Bill S-216 is the answer to everything. It's another piece uh, of the puzzle. Uh, it's another. It's a step in that direction that uh, can allow for um, foundations and philanthropic sources of, of funding to be invested in uh, in indigenous uh, organizations, indigenous communities, uh, where it can do uh, do amazing good. What else needs to be done besides Bill S-216 to get the sector to better prioritize giving to Indigenous organizations and communities? I think there's great opportunity for increased investment within Indigenous organizations. And knowing that there are many that are non-qualified donees, uh, Meanwhile, also knowing there are many who are qualified donees, but the level of funding that they receive from the philanthropic sector has not been on an, on an equitable uh, playing field as, uh, as many of the, the non-Indigenous uh, similar style or organizations. And there's many reasons in the background for why that uh, is in place. Some of those aspects uh, include that uh, the organizations had become dependent on um, government sources of funds, or there may be other other reasons why uh, they haven't. But one of the overarching reasons is they haven't had access. They haven't been invited to the tables within the philanthropic sector to uh, really be able to share and make their case of what they're doing and how they can do it. And Within the philanthropic sector, there's uh, many long established relationships between charitable organizations and, uh, and donors. And that those relationships, many of them, some of them have been for over 100 years, that they're, uh, they've already got established where these mm -hmm. funds are going, how much, how they're dividing those funds, what, what they've been investing in. And for a long time, Indigenous peoples, communities, and organizations were largely, um, they were largely excluded. And the, the number that you represent at 0.5% demonstrates that that in inclusion is still uh, in process, that they're still largely excluded. Uh, and there needs to be greater bridge building, greater opportunities uh, to be able to uh, invest more in Indigenous organizations, uh, in the impact uh, and the, the potential and possibilities of what's out there. And in order to do that, uh, that means that many within the philanthropic sector need to be willing to take a step back themselves, look at how do, what percentage of impact do they have currently for, for their investments? How can they change in a historical and current narratives uh, so that they can work towards um, change within change within themselves uh, that allow them to really meet indigenous peoples and communities and organizations where they're at uh, because in order to uh, change that narrative in order to build bridges they are going to need to uh, have a sense of humility because their system structures and processes may be the barriers themselves that are causing that divergence. And so in being able to approach that and, and uh, take on some of those transformational change elements uh, within themselves is a huge aspect of how we can uh, work towards uh, changing the 0 0.5 number to being a very different reality. And, um, in addition to the change uh, transformationally within themselves as it relates to a reconciliation journey, it's then being able to really um, go out and work with Indigenous peoples and organizations on a relationship-driven manner 
where trust can be built uh, and long-term impact can be achieved. And doing that uh, in a way where it's uh, purposefully not being transactional, but instead relationship-based. Because if you just go to say, if you cold call some organization and say, hey, we've got this program, can we come in and do this one thing? Or can we provide some funding one time or just for two years? We just wanna, uh, we just wanna support this initiative for now. And that's a checkbox on their end. It's not going to uh, lead towards that long-term change. There needs to be that willingness to really say, hey, we would love to come alongside. We'd love to provide some supports. We would love to engage in some multi-year agreements and that where this door is opening a door for that long-term um, relationship where there's long-term supports that are being put on the table. And so that's another element to that. Yes, and I, I guess um, to your point, Bill S216 is one of those steps of breaking down um, the old system that created barriers for building that kind of ongoing relationship. Is that sort of how you view it? Uh, that's exactly the way I'd view it. Uh, it is one of those steps uh, of, of many steps that we need to take. And that's part of the this reconciliation journey that we are on uh, within Canada is there's we know that to get to where we want to be, it may may take maybe generations from now. But every decision we make here and now um, that we're willing to take the steps to get to where we, we see the potential is and where we see these relationships should be, that, uh, that every step changes things, changes uh, the future and uh, looks towards the seven generations ahead. And so this is a step in that direction. Well, I would love to talk about um, the kind of work that Rideau Hall Foundation has undertaken in terms of furthering that reconciliation journey. From your experience, can you provide um, a, a bit of overview of some of the work that's been done? For sure. Within the Rideau Hall Foundation, uh, we have uh, taken efforts to ensure that the staff have a, a good, strong um cultural competency, uh, cultural safety and humility, a variety of, of ways of saying it, but being able to uh, have a good grounding and a good understanding uh, for themselves personally, for themselves as uh, working in a team and, and in supporting um, in a variety of ways across the nation, and uh, to be able to ensure that they understand uh, what are the proper protocols, how do we show respect, how can we walk with humility? How can we be flexible to ensure that we're meeting the unique needs of the people that we're serving? And uh, then beyond that, being able to ensure that if we are working uh, in support uh, of uh, Indigenous peoples and communities, that we also need to, uh, there needs to be Indigenous representation. And there needs to be Indigenous representation over and above just myself or uh, just uh, th that it's not just uh, having one person to fix uh, or everything or be the answer to every question. Uh, instead, it's being able to know that uh, we need to have Indigenous peoples involved within our governance and, and we have Indigenous uh, board members. We need to have uh, Indigenous involvement on our staff. We need to have Indigenous involvement in our programs uh, in terms of advisories and selection committees and uh, various bodies that may be formed. And the Rideau Hall Foundation has taken those steps to ensure that there is uh, active representation throughout our organization so that when we're also then going to work with or provide funding for or uh, et cetera, that those um, relationships aren't um, aren't coming from a place where it causes potential harm because there there isn't that uh, that competency. There isn't the flexibility to really strive towards meeting their unique needs um, and and trying to uh, reverse that uh, um, traditional funder power relationship where you have a whole bunch of red tape that dictates how you as a funded organization can operate uh, and instead being able to have and work towards more of a trust-based relationship. 
And so the Rideau Hall Foundation is, uh, has, is and has taken many steps. Uh, it, it's still not perfect. There's still more to be done. And that's the journey that uh, many organizations all across Canada uh, are taking as non-Indigenous organizations uh, with a strong desire to work with, uh, walk in relationship with uh, Indigenous peoples, communities, uh, and organizations across Canada. I, I agree. I think there is a, a great desire among many organizations um, to, to continue this journey. Um, do you have any sort of suggestions or um, starting points for perhaps organizations that aren't even as, as large as Rideau Hall, for example, and who aren't sure how to get started on this journey? Well, and this is a, a journey that it's a challenge uh, and it's a challenge that needs to be taken seriously. And so when considering uh, how can we take this on, uh, this challenge of reconciliation on, uh, it, it really needs to, uh, to begin not with simply creating a statement or putting some words out there. And, and, and I, I want to acknowledge uh, an elder that had uh, spoken with me years ago and talking about this process, his simple words were, do not let your words be hollow. And in order to act that out, that means that there needs to be action. And there needs to be action that uh, may go before the words. Uh, and that if you're serious about change, it's starting to really look, look within yourself as an individual uh, because if as individuals we don't understand uh, what does reconciliation mean for me, it's going to be really hard to professionally apply it. And so once you've taken that time to really um, tackle that in yourself, then being able to try and tackle that within the organization because reconciliation could mean change as that relates to your 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 bylaws it could be policy changes it could be uh, human resources uh, based uh, practices changes uh, it could mean uh, being able to put have uh, stronger uh, diversity and inclusion uh, practices and policies it could mean uh, it could mean many many different things depending on the organization and how you function but it is being willing to uh, to take action and then uh, start that journey uh, and make it an individual journey as law uh, in addition to being an organizational journey because it, as everybody comes on board with that broader common understanding a broad better competency um, that starts to be transformational for how you do your work externally and who's impacted and how you go about that work and so uh, I believe it's a valuable process for every individual and every organization. And although reconciliation can be an often overused term and, and hard to understand, uh, at the same time, uh, take it as a challenge to really reflect on what does it mean for you, your context, uh, your journey ahead, and how, what could that uh being able to really establish that vision uh, for yourself and or for your organization. Thank you. That was, those are some really profound um, thoughts and, and, and quite transformational kind of advice. So I appreciate uh, you sharing that. Um, I'd, I'd like to find out a little bit more and give you an opportunity to speak a little bit more about the initiatives uh, that the Rideau Hall Foundation is currently working on to support Indigenous communities and organizations. Maybe you wanted to have a little bit of a deeper discussion about that so that our audience can understand that? Yeah, for sure. With uh, one uh, program, as I'd mentioned earlier, is the Arctic Inspiration Prize. Uh, we act as managing partner. Uh, so it's governed by Northern Trust, uh, which is majority Indigenous. And we have the opportunity of supporting the prize structure, uh, which entails uh, inspiring people in communities to have uh, conversations at their dinner tables around what are some of the opportunities, some of the challenges, some of the barriers uh, that, that they're experiencing, and 
what could they do to change that narrative? How can they uh, improve? Uh, how can they better serve, provide new opportunities uh, for their community? Building a team, putting in a nomination, and they could uh, receive um, youth category, $100,000, AIP category, $500,000 investment, or uh, a $1 million uh, prize uh, that uh, will support them to do what they created that the initiatives that are put forward are community driven, they're defined by community, the team members who are, are going to run these initiatives um, are, are from community. And uh, it gives the opportunity for seed investment into initiatives that uh, can be transformational uh, and can impact lives in profound ways. And uh, if you uh, check out the uh, Arctic Inspiration Prize website, you will see many laureates uh, of the Arctic Inspiration Prize who are uh, across a broad range of, of different sectors from uh, preschools, uh, Inuit Montessori style uh, preschools to on the land healing and, and cultural programming to building a greenhouse for uh, a working farm uh, on reserve near Dawson City to um, a variety of different types of initiatives. Uh, and so they can span education, uh, science, culture, uh, so many different possibilities, but being able to invest in, uh, in the North uh, and, and strive towards it being by the North for the North, uh, where we're, we're walking as in that allyship role where, where they're providing those supports, some of the administration and management. Uh, but we have Northern manager, the trust has Northern managers that help to uh, really operate that across uh, the north, and uh, that, that's one 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 aspect of our operations. Uh, the other, uh, as I had mentioned, we are uh, working on building out um, an opportunity to provide greater supports and play an allyship role in Indigenous teacher education. And in doing that, this is a, this is a, uh, a a different journey than most organizations go on because it's one where we really want to uh, strive to uphold that allyship role. But to do so, uh, being an ally uh, really means we're, try we're striving to not uh, play the traditional power role. We want to be backstage. We want to be championing on the work that's happening and the amazing opportunities that are present. Uh, but being able to provide valuable supports uh, financial supports, uh, being able to connect people. And uh, in doing that, we, we uh, will be providing, um, well, to begin with, we started with listening and learning over the last year, meeting with numerous institutions that are providing Indigenous teacher education programs. And that's helped to inform how can we better position ourselves to be able to work within this space. And then we are in the process of uh, we're going to be releasing an open call for a national advisory committee on Indigenous teacher education in the coming weeks. And we are also going to be going out and meeting with, uh, with, with the many stakeholders that are present within the Indigenous teacher education space, which is more than just uh, the programs that are being delivered themselves, but communities, school divisions, uh, et cetera, and being able to continue that listening and learning journey because we don't want to set something up where we, we think we have the answer or have the solution to how we can uh, affect change. Uh, and instead, we really want to go out and allow uh, what we do to be informed by uh, Indigenous peoples, Indigenous communities, Indigenous organizations, uh, and institutions who are partnering uh, in support of that. And to do that, it, it means that at every step of the way, instead of having a linear path where it's like, here's what we're going to do, here's our outcomes, our stated objectives, and we're going to go and we've got all of these, uh, all, everything mapped out with check boxes and, and action plans. Uh, and instead, it means that the approach that we take has to be more flexible. And it has to, at every step of the way, uh, move back to that inform stage, back to that listening and learning. And it might evolve a little bit when it gets to the next step. 
And so that process and that journey, it takes a lot more time. It takes a lot more effort. But at the end of the day, it means that we are going to not be out there doing our own thing. Instead, we're working in collaboration. We're working in partnership. We're walking in relationship. And we're meeting the needs that have been identified uh, and being allowed for the meeting of that needs to be uh, met through Indigenous-led and Indigenous-driven initiatives. And that we're playing a background role to provide uh, support within. So that's a, a, a journey that's a little bit different than the norm, uh, but it's, it's one that we are on uh, currently uh, with the Rideau Hall Foundation. Well, I, I think what you're talking about is, is truly a transformational kind of way that charities can work in partnership as opposed to um, you know, a transactional sort of experience um, with communities, um, Indigenous communities and Northern communities for sure. It's, um, it's fascinating to hear that process as it's being undertaken and um, would love to hear more in the, in the future in terms of the outcomes. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit and ask you about, um, you know, the Rideau Hall Foundation is a signatory on the Circle's Declaration of Action for the Philanthropic Community. Can you talk a little bit about that declaration, what it means to the Rideau Hall Foundation to be part of it, and why other organizations should get involved? Yeah, the Declaration of Action uh in essence, uh, as I mentioned earlier about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 Calls to Action and their underlying principles of reconciliation, along with the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, uh, which is the number one principle of uh, reconciliation put forward by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, that the declaration um, carries that f- what was, has been brought forward in those areas uh, within the philanthropic sector. It's a, it's a way of being able to look at how can we ensure that we are taking that time uh, to really reflect on what does reconciliation mean for us? How can we walk this out? And how can we do that in a good way that's reciprocal, uh, that, that it allows for rep- 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 reciprocity, reciprocity, sorry, there we go. And... Uh, allows that reconciliation-based journey to be uh, carried out in a manner where there are certain expectations and standards that are outlined uh, of how we can act and how we should um, really challenge ourselves uh, to be able to walk uh, in a good way. And and just to reference, when I mention good way, I, that I, I've been, I'm Métis from Saskatchewan. And uh, uh, have also been uh, raised with with many uh, many prairies and uh, Cree uh, teachings, and walking in a good way for me means uh, being able to really ensure that every action uh, that you take is being done uh, from the heart. It's being done with the intentions of being able to uh, give back to community in a, in a good way, uh, being able to uh, th- that it's not individual minded but community minded. And uh, that uh, you're not trying to cause harm, that you're trying to, uh, to make sure that every step is being done well. And as that relates to the declaration, that's the intentionality of the declaration is how can we walk in a good way? And it gives some guidance. Uh, it, it holds people to a standard uh, to say, if you sign on to this, we also expect you to walk this out. How can you uh, ensure that your actions are representative to what's being spoken, or what's being signed uh, within this declaration? So it, the the declaration uh, on behalf of, of the Rito Hall Foundation, it's a commitment towards uh, being willing to continue this long term journey. Uh, that it's not uh, it's not a, a sign and done. It's sign to commit to um, five years from now, 10 years from now, 50 years from now, you can still look back and go, we're still on that journey. This is still a part of uh, how we can uh, ensure that we're being accountable and effective and working towards uh, what we see possible. 
you've uh, talked a, a certain amount about allyship, and um, I'd like to hear your perspective on what it means for nonprofit organizations in Canada to be an Indigenous ally and how organizations can improve in becoming stronger allies. Could you give us your wisdom and experience on that? Yeah, being an ally is a part of that relationship process uh, between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples uh, in Canada. And being an ally is uh, willing to recognize that each of us have uh, experiences that uh, give us unique perspectives on life, uh, on how we view our communities, uh, that we each have unique ways of, of knowing, doing, and being. And as we approach each other, uh, as an ally, there's, there's two parties, right? That as, as we approach each other, we recognize that we each have those unique journeys, those perspectives, and that given, given those different ways of seeing, um, that you're willing to work together, that you're willing to uh, support each other, you're willing to, to have a, a sense of humility in how you go about that approach, that as an ally, you're not, uh, not fixed on, it's going to be my way or the highway. It's, it's going to be, uh, this is what we are looking to do. This is how we would love to work together to open doors, uh, but not to dictate that you either join us or you don't, or you don't, uh, or you, you, you can join us if you meet our eligibility criteria. Uh, and if we maybe create unintentional barriers in that process, so be it. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to really um, be able to have um, an effective relationship. And relationships, as we know in our personal lives, they can be messy. Things cannot always work out perfect. It may not, uh, there may be disagreements at times. And uh, in acknowledging that, it's, uh, it's being able to say, hey, we're willing to work together. We're willing to work through these things. Uh, we're willing to work through some of the historical um, differences. Uh, and we're willing to be flexible to better understand how can we meet your needs? How can we serve you um, and... Uh, be able to to really uh, allow for the impact that's being proposed uh, to be one that is uh, driven by uh, indigenous driven, indigenous led, uh, and not uh, not having a, a not having red tape, not having um, striving to change that power relationship, and so really being an ally is kind of all of those things, and. Uh, at the heart of it, it really just comes back down to how can we walk in a good way? How can we be intentional about being flexible? How can we acknowledge that the systems and structures um, of those who we're working with who have the self-determination to create their own system and structures, uh, how can we meet them where they're at with their way of doing? Thank you, Bill, for your insights into Bill S216 and its potential impact on the nonprofit sector and Indigenous communities across Canada, and for your wisdom as well and the important work that you do at the Rideau Hall Foundation. It's most helpful for nonprofits to hear your views, and I really want to thank you for joining us and sharing your thoughts. No problem. Thank you very much uh, for having me. It's been an honor. Uh, merci.